My name is Steve Begg. I'm a professor at the Australian School of Petroleum, also head of that school. Um, before coming to um, University of Adelaide uh, about 11 years ago, I spent uh, nearly 20 years in the oil and gas industry. So my talk this morning is going to be mainly about what it's like to be a petroleum engineer. I'm not going to tell you about how to get into uni, what subjects to study, what it'll be like studying petroleum engineering at uni. You can get all of those uh, pieces of information um, elsewhere from the web. So this is really a story of, of what it's like to be a petroleum engineer. And you will see my title here is a bit of a strange um, title, Pigs, Foams and Fishing. That's because the oil and gas industry started developing in the 1850s. It was a very pragmatic, practical industry, and it developed a very sort of rich uh, language associated with it. So you'll hear a bit about um, what pigs are and why we use foams uh, and why it is that we hate going fishing. So first of all, just to set the scene, it is um, quite surprising how dependent our society is on oil and gas. It's not just the um, petrol, so you can see this is a US slide, petrol for cars, but petroleum makes up many of the things that we use from day to day. So all of these seat covers are made from petroleum. I guess this flooring is probably made from petroleum. All of the plastics, any man-made fibers that you're wearing are made from petroleum. It pervades the way that we live and that we want to live today, whether we like it or not. Petroleum is still measured in barrels. Barrel is 42 gallons. It's about that around and about that high. And the world needs, at the moment, about 90 million of those barrels every day. And it's the job of a petroleum engineer to try to help find and produce that amount of petroleum to keep um, uh, the world in, in the way that it's used to living. Some people are quite surprised to find out that the petroleum industry is mainly owned by nation states, government owned oil companies. Only 11% of the world's petroleum is owned by the sorts of companies that, whose names you might be familiar with. Um, Shell, Exxon, Esso, Goodside, Santos, BP. All of those collectively count for only 11% of the world's um, petroleum reserves. And those companies themselves are owned generally by pension funds and by insurance companies. So whenever these commercial oil and gas companies make a profit, it's going to pay off people's pensions and insurance claims, usually. Just to drive home the idea of how dependent we are on oil and gas, this is a house in the United States where they've taken everything out of it, except the humans, of course, um, that is made of petroleum. So visually, it just gives you an idea of how much we do and use every day that is totally dependent on the supply of sufficient petroleum. So there are a number of people who help contribute to the finding and supply. I'm going to start with the uh, geologists. And um, you might figure out in a little minute why they like hammers uh, and explosions. I'm actually a geophysicist by uh, background. So oil and gas is found deep uh, within the Earth's surface. It's generated at high temperature and high pressure by the breakdown of organic material, anything from plankton, amoeba, plants, up to um, uh, possibly even dinosaurs um, uh, were contributing to petroleum. After it has been produced, it finds its way up through cracks in the Earth caused by old earthquakes, or possibly just through the rocks very slowly until it hits a layer of rock that it can't move through, and it gathers underneath it, the uh, gas sitting on top of oil, sitting on top of water. And the job is to find these structures and to drill through them um, uh, to, see if there, to see if there's anything there. Just to give you an idea of how much one of these wells costs, offshore these days, it might cost you $100 million just to drill a single well to look for oil and gas and about one in 10 are successful. So we're having to throw away a lot of money um, and recover it um, elsewhere. So how do we find them? Um, we use the equivalent of ultrasound. You should be familiar with the idea of ultrasound, um, perhaps for medical imaging. Um, bats use ultrasound to see and to catch their prey. They set out sound waves. Sound waves are reflected back. They can find their prey or they can find, um, uh, avoid flying around obstacles. 
geophysicists set off small explosions or hammer the ground very hard and the sound waves are transmitted through the earth and reflected back up again. For those of you who are doing any um, year uh, 11, 12 maths or physics, um, it's exactly the same equations are used for this for, as for studying uh, the transmission of light through different glass. So instead of uh, these being different layers of glass with different speeds of light, these are different layers of rock with different speeds of sound. From this, it's possible to interpret roughly what the ground below might be like and decide whether or not to drill. Now the rocks themselves, this is um, pretty well a true scale picture. It's, one, it's about two to three meters um, high. If we were to zoom in on that, we would find that it's made up of lots of tiny little grains. And if we zoomed in further, in this case with a scanning electron microscope, we would see the grain, individual grains of sand. These are maybe a millimeter in size. And then there's lots of little spaces between them, maybe a tenth of a millimeter to a half a millimeter in size. That's where the oil and the gas is. Contrary to popular belief, there's not a nice big hole or a big cave sitting in the ground and we just suck it out. It's in the rock. It's almost, uh, it would be similar to if you have a car and you leave it sitting on your driveway, you've got a concrete or a tile driveway, it leaks a little bit of oil, the oil seeps into um, the tiles and the concrete in your driveway. That's how the oil and gas is found in the world. Our wells are separated by maybe a half a kilometer or a kilometer. So really we have to suck that oil, which could be like, uh, it could be as thick as treacle, um, more like cooking oil a lot of the time. We have to suck that through the rock into the well to produce those 90 million barrels per day. So it's no mean feat to do that. So the people who um, drill and recover the oil are petroleum engineers. There's three types of petroleum engineers um, that you could specialize in if you decided to go this route. One are the people who drill the wells and um, may not be obvious to you um, how you drill around corners. So it's pretty obvious how you can drill a straight well, but if you're drilling with steel and a bit, how do you actually manage to get that around a corner, uh, which is what we need to do if we're drilling offshore. Then there are the facilities and production engineers, the people who deal with how the wells are connected to the reservoir and the flow of fluids up to the surface and the processing up there. And then the reservoir engineers who deal with how the oil, the water and the gas are going to move inside the rocks and figuring out where to put these wells and what sorts of treatments to put down them to enhance the flow of fluids into the reservoir. So I'm going to start with the reservoir engineers. I call these people um, the Lego people. And the reason I call them the Lego people is because they build models. They happen to be computer models, but they're models of the earth beneath our feet as if it was made up of lots of little blocks almost like Lego blocks, and we often show those blocks colored to show some of the properties of the rock. Two of properties of the rock that are very important to us, one is porosity, that's how much space there is between the grains of the rock, maybe 10% if we're lucky, and the other is permeability, how easy is it for the fluid to flow through the rock, it's a bit like um, conductivity of a wire. So they make models of those. Each of those building blocks um, would be about the size of this lecture theatre, maybe about half the height of it, but the same sort of size. And a model may consist of hundreds of millions, possibly even a billion of those little blocks describing the properties of the earth below the surface. So here they start off, um, this is a plan view looking down on one of these models, and roughly this would be 15 kilometres by 10 kilometres to give you uh, an idea of scale and you can see the size of a tiny little um, block in here, just one block. This is an old river system. Because we don't really know what's down there, we don't really know the porosity and the permeability, we have to use geology to help us. So at the well locations, here's some well locations where my pointer is now, those are about a kilometre or so apart, we actually get a little piece of rock out of the earth and can measure some properties on it. We get about one trillionth of the reservoir out to make some properties on before we make decisions to invest maybe 10 to $50 billion. So we're investing incredibly large sums of money based on very little um, data. And so a lot of what you do at high school now, even in your um, year 11 and 12 maths on probability and statistics comes directly into play to helping us make those decisions. This is an old river system where the red is nice coarse rock, a bit like one of those dried up rivers you might see in the outback in Australia, and will have very good porosity and permeability. The um, 
purple rock has got no porosity and permeability. The other colors are sort of somewhere in between. So from this guess at geology, this is only one way the geology might be right. It, the, um, it's right only at the well points. Everywhere else, it's a guess. So we have to have lots of these models um, developed probabilistically. We make a guess at what the porosity and the permeability. In this case, um, this is permeability. And the red are the high permeability. And the blue is the low permeability. So from this, we can figure out maybe where the best place to put the wells are and how much they're going to produce. To give you a rough idea, again, of scale, um, if we were to compare this to Adelaide, this edge of my model here would be, say, at Grand Junction Road, and this would be the Marion Shopping Centre down here, and the oil platform sitting above the CBD. The water here is a couple of meters, sorry, a couple of hundred meters thick, so it's barely the thickness of my pointer on this slide, and there's three kilometers worth of rock have been stripped away, and these are the positions of all of the wells that are planned for the development of that reservoir. These development wells themselves could be 10, 20, 30 million dollars each. So we want to minimize the number that go there and the best place to put them. To visualize these, we have some pretty sophisticated um, hardware and software. This is a picture of ex-Prime Minister John Howard opening a visualization facility that we've got at the Australian School of Petroleum. If you want to go and pretty well stand where he is with the 3D goggles on and see some 3D visualization, um, that will be at, I believe, um, 2.15 and 12.30. But you might need to check your program on that. I might not have got that quite right. The 2.15 I know is right. The 12.30 I wasn't quite sure of. So you can have a, a view around this system. Um, we've got a very simple system. Uh, the big oil and gas companies have got a system where they have a cave or a cube where five of the sides are computer screens each um, controlled by an independent um, projector backlit. So you walk in here and the floor um, beneath you, the ceiling, the two walls at the side and the wall in front of you are views of this model. You wear the 3D goggles and you can feel like you're walking around inside the earth. You've got a head tracker on. So if you turn your head, the computer knows that I want to say, look around this piece of rock. So it will recompute the whole image and I'll be able to see it. The oil and gas industry, um, is really high tech. After the military who get um, the latest and greatest in terms of computers, um, the medical industry and the oil and gas industry are the next to use the latest and greatest in terms of computing power. Um, I should have said engineering, like petroleum engineering, like any other form of engineering is largely about design, not about building. So if you see um, people out there, you see images in the media of people on rigs moving pipes around and mud flying around, those are not petroleum engineers. Petroleum engineers um, are designing um, what is going to be built, often office based, sometimes um, based out in the field if you're a production engineer. So sometimes um, whenever we recover the oil and gas, we're lucky if we can get um, about 35% out. So we leave 65% behind in any given reservoir on average. And that's just because the oil, and the oil price today um, is not big enough to pay for the cost of recovering it. Um, if the world decides we need more oil and gas, the price will go up and we'll um, implement uh, new forms of technology to be able to recover more of what's left there. So there's absolutely no sign yet of the world running out of oil and gas. Current reserves estimates um, are about 50 years out and reserves are only those things that we know can be produced today with current technology and current economics. Change either of those two things and the world's reserves um, increase. It's often not talked about in the press. So we can um, thin, it, thin out the oil by heating it up um, uh, to make it a bit less viscous. We can use acid to dissolve the rock to increase flow. Um, sometimes we get water coming into the reservoir. We need to stop that water coming in and we can do that by injecting stuff that's pretty much like shaving foam um, or jello. And we can even crack open the ground um, to be able to enhance the ability of the oil and gas to flow in. So imagine um, being able to crack open the earth three kilometers below you, only a crack maybe that high and it might only extend the width of this stage. Um, but imagine the pumps that are needed to be able um, to, to crack that open. So some pretty heavy duty equipment. To do any of these things, we need to know, is it economic? Is it going to cost, is it going to give us more benefit than it costs? So to do that, we need to have mathematical models implemented through computer models 
to predict the effect of these physical, chemical, and biological processes on our recovery. Um, it's a bit like playing SimCity for real. Um, you know, you've got a 50-year 50, 50 lifetime field. Uh, you have to drill wells. The wells cost money. You have to keep it profitable. And you're simulating into the future. The drilling engineers call those spaghetti pushers because we drill wells with drill pipe. That's about that diameter. And the thickness of the steel is about the thickness of my little finger. So it comes in 30-foot sections. We put a drill bit on it, drill down, screw in another 30-foot section, drill down, keep going like that until we get to where we want it to be. If you were to, <coughs> to line up 10 kilometers of drill pipe on a long straight piece of road and push it hard enough, it would just um, buckle up like uh, wet spaghetti. So drill pipe can be very flexible, and that's the key to being able to drill round corners um, at a very slow rate. So here's a couple of um, drill rigs. This is a semi-submersible rig. It can be moved to many places in the ocean. These things might cost anywhere between a million and a million and a half dollars a day to lease, which is what most companies do. It might take 40 or 50 days to drill a well, so there's, there's 50 million dollars of your 100 million dollars just for the drilling cost, the lease of the rig. Some drill bits. <coughs> this uh, drill bit, in fact, is one very much like this. You can see it at our display in the foyer um, at Ingeny Wadley, uh, the Ingeny Wadley build building. Um, it's about um, 10 inches in diameter, about that size. Here's a diamond drill bit for move, drilling through extremely um, hard rock. Each of these little bumps on here is a diamond. I estimated there were about 2,000 diamonds on there. That might get used on one well. So that's another big cost. This is a coring bit for drilling down and leaving a little hole of, or a little column of rock behind us. That's the bit of rock that we can take out of the reservoir and measure its rock, um, porosities and permeabilities to find out what it might be like. So to drill a well, we first of all um, go in with the drill bit, drill down um, to a certain depth, and then so that the open hole doesn't collapse in, the well doesn't collapse in, we have to pull it back out again, put in some steel casing, and then we cement that casing in by injecting cement from the top. So that will come down. We push the cement around by this stuff called mud, which I'll explain again in a bit. The mud pushes it around, and eventually that um, well is, or the piece of casing is cemented in. And then we just start with a slightly smaller drill bit, and we keep going and going and going until we get down to um, where it is we're aiming for. <coughs> this thing called mud is not really mud, it's um, a liquid made up of very specific um, physical and chemical properties. It's used to help lubricate the bit, so as we drill through the earth, we need to be able to lubricate the bit. We need to get the stuff out of the hole, so if you're drilling a hole 10 kilometers long, you have to get the rock out, and we do that by pumping this mud down the middle of this drill bit, and then it comes up around the back side of it and carries all the rock chippings up with it as well. It's also a safety device. Its density is calculated such that at the point that we um, uh, intersect some oil and gas, the weight of this mud is going to be greater than the pressure of the oil and gas, so it doesn't come spewing up um, out of the well and causing problems. Nowadays, <coughs> we are able to drill uh, wells that have many branches going off them, and by very slowly turning the drill bit, maybe a half a degree at a time, we can drill down and gradually curve around and drill out maybe five to 10 kilometers in a horizontal direction. To be able to drill out in a horizontal direction, we need pressure, we need something to push it through the rock, and again, the, the mud can provide that pressure um, on the drill bit for us. Once we've drilled, we might have some, uh, we want to find out what's down the well. Uh, we put some physics experiments down there, we put an, uh, a resistivity experiment on where we have a cathode and an anode, we pass an electric current through the rock. If the rock contains water with dissolved salts in it, we're going to get a current flowing easily and a low resistance, so there's probably not oil and gas there. If there's oil and gas in the rock, it's a resistor. We won't um, get much of a current flowing, and we can measure that to figure out just the properties of the fluid. To figure out what the porosity of the rock is, we have another little sound wave exper um, experiment. Um, we um, create some sound waves in the reservoir and we measure the speed with which the sound travels through the reservoir. If there's lots of porosity, it's going to travel quite slowly. If there is um, very little porosity, it's going to travel uh, quite quickly. So we're putting you know, physics experiments down here on the ends of wires. Sometimes they get uh, trapped in there. If they get trapped or caught, we have to pull everything out. And remember, we're paying a million dollars a day. 
we have to go down with a big spike and try and fish it out, which is why we don't like going fishing, because it's very expensive. And if we can't do that, we have to put on one of those diamond drill bits, and we just go drill through that piece of equipment that's uh, stuck down there, and there's a few more hundred thousand dollars of expenditure gone. So the third group of people are the plumbers. They're the people who work with um, the connection from the wells uh, or the reservoirs up through the well to the, um, uh, to the processing facilities. This is a subsea wellhead and gathering center. Um, this is a blowout preventer, um, sometimes called a Christmas tree because they used to be a little bit more sort of Christmas tree shaped and have little bits and pieces hanging off the edges of them. So they started to be called Christmas trees. Imagine the um, difficulty in designing this piece of equipment to be put in place at a depth greater than any human can go, so you have to have a remote operating vehicle to put it in place, and then operate flawlessly for 50 years as it, as it gets covered up by mud and sand and salt water around it. So quite, quite a challenge to design, put in place and maintain this equipment. This is an offshore production platform. Um, typically platforms these days, there are two platforms. One is living quarters and another is where the operations are for safety um, sake. If you work on these platforms, you typically work two, two weeks on, two weeks off. You fly out to the platform, work 12 hour shifts. Um, out there you will find gyms, uh, theatre, um, excellent, you know, top restaurant quality food. So it can be sort of quite a good living experience, you come back and you've got a couple of weeks off. I used to work in Alaska. Some people worked up on the north slope of Alaska for two weeks. They lived in California, went back to California for a couple of weeks, back up to Alaska, back down. So while, while you're young and unencumbered, that can be a pretty good lifestyle and they'll pay you more for doing that. Typical salaries, starting salaries for a petroleum engineer straight out of uni these days are about $80,000 for somebody with no experience. So very good salaries, and they may pay you another you know, $20,000 or more to work um, offshore. This is a big pump. Um, we produce gas associated with the oil. If we can't sell the gas, we can't obviously vent it into the atmosphere. This pump has been around for about 35 years, and it re-injects about 300 million cubic meters of gas every day back into a reservoir. To get it up to that pressure, we fire up a couple of jet aircraft engines. So this is a six story building. There's two jet aircraft engines in it. When the jet aircraft engines are, um, are fired up, um, the gas is put into the aircraft engine. Now remember, um, you know, natural gas is highly flammable. So this compressor has to, um, well, there's a lot of safety mechanisms. We pressure up that gas and inject it at very high rates um, back into the reservoir. This thing has worked flawlessly for 35 years. Amazing piece of engineering. Um, pipelines. Pipelines need to be um, cleaned out every um, so often and um, they're cleaned out with things called pigs and if you've ever watched some James Bond films you will have seen some pigs. Um, they are little, look like capsules that go into a pipeline. In the Bond films they went in um, and a, you know, an agent was paced inside the pig and the pig goes through the pipeline and gets them out of the country type of thing. Um, so they go around the pipelines cleaning them up. Um, some of them are very unsophisticated pigs. Um, you can even get um, a brochure, so this comes direct from a brochure, and this thing is called an intelligent pig. And this pig can do extra sort of work within the pipeline. Some of them can take x-rays, some of them are able to um, go into the pipelines and help do remedial work and do any extra wells that are needed um, inside. So we can even get up to uh, super intelligent pigs, which are quite impressive. Pipelines, I was here, uh, actually, um, this is the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. I was fortunate enough to be there um, about three weeks ago in Alaska. This pipeline travels about uh, 1,500 kilometers over some of the most inhospitable tr terrain in the world. It was built um, back in the 70s. You can see here it's built on little stilts. Um, these stilts about um, every 50 meters. Uh, there is a little railway track between two stilts and then the pipeline sits on a little railway bogey and that's in case there's an earthquake so that the pipeline doesn't fracture. That was done not because of the oil, the, the economic cost of the oil that would be spilt, that's pretty minimal, you can shut down the pipeline. It was done to help protect the environment. It was also built at a height such that the caribou could um, uh, migrate underneath it. And there are um, some very special fins on the top of each of these to take the heat away from the pipeline so it doesn't melt the permafrost. So this um, 
cost, I, can't, I think it was about $30 billion, or maybe that's in today's terms, an enormous cost to build this pipeline, and a large part of that cost done for environmental protection. 30 odd years ago in the oil and gas industry, we didn't use the word environment in the same way as we use the word environment today. There weren't um, environmental lobbies, um, but the oil and gas industry was still spending a lot of money um, for environmental protection. So contrary to some of the things that you hear um, in the media, the oil and gas industry spends enormous, I've, I've been there, I've seen it, it spends enormous sums on both healthy, health and safety and on um, environmental protection. In fact, some of the biggest costs um, that, that they have. Um, another area that petroleum engineers and geoscientists are starting to work in now is carbon sequestration. So taking um, the idea is to take carbon out of static sources, um, such as um, power plants and cement factories. They generate a lot of um, CO2. Um, take that CO2, compress it, so we, all, we know all about how to do high level, high volume compression. Find an old reservoir, um, which by definition, if there's a reservoir there, it hasn't leaked over geological time, and inject the CO2 back into uh, the reservoir. So that's quite an interesting twist, given that um, a lot of the CO2 is produced by burning fossil fuels in the first place. Um, so in uh, summary, we have, um, there are some great benefits um, to this job and to this industry. If you're interested in traveling, you can get to travel all around the world. I'll show you where I traveled um, in a little bit. Um, you get to design and play with some very sophisticated uh, computer equipment and other uh, machinery and software. There's excellent employment opportunities. Lots of petroleum engineers in their 40s and 50s moving out of the industry. There's a known worldwide shortage. That's why the salaries um, are so high. You can get employed with oil and gas companies. You can get employed with the service companies that supply oil and gas companies. You can get employed by the government to help governments exploit their resources or to regulate how they're being exploited. And you can get employed with consultants. The salaries, well, you can see I haven't updated this to the 80,000, are excellent. Um, many of the senior managers, if you're interested in a managerial career um, in the oil and gas industry, started out as petroleum engineers or petroleum geoscientists. It does not hire generalist managers, people with um, MBAs and business degrees who don't know anything about the business to come in and manage it. You need to know how the business operates to be able to manage it. So there's an opportunity to go up um, that ladder, but there's also an opportunity to go up um, to stay technical. So one of the nice things about the oil and gas industry is that there are often technical ladders where you can get paid as much as managers. And so if you know, your goal is to increase your salary, you don't necessarily have to go the managerial route if what you want to do is to stay technical and still get a good, uh, good salary. And you can work in offices, you can work in the field. Um, some of the large oil and gas companies have research centers, so you can work in labs, or you can work in labs of the um, service companies. And this was important to me, may not be important to you, um, but I know that I was doing something incredibly useful to help produce um, a product that we totally depend on today. It's not, you know, if the world's oil supply was reduced by 10% today, the consequences you wouldn't really even want to think about. They're really that bad. Um, these are the places that I've managed to um, uh, travel. Um, places in blue are where I've uh, lived, now in Adelaide. Places in yellow are where my work has taken me. And the places in orange are where the industry has paid me enough money and made me close enough to be able to go um, on vacation. So I like to travel. That was great. Um, you could stay here in uh, Adelaide and work with Santos for the rest of your career if you're not interested in travel. Or you might take short-term postings to other places. So to uh, conclude, um, if you're interested in uh, petroleum engineering, um, you can study it here at the University of Adelaide. There's a four-year degree in petroleum engineering but you can also take an extra year and get a combined degree, get it combined with chemical, mechanical, geology and geophysics, civil and structural, or mining engineering. So that gives you a few more options as to where you might um, go with your career if you're not sure that you wanted to be in petroleum engineering. We have scholarships to the value of over um, $40,000 over the course of the um, program. We typically give three to four of those scholarships per year. Typically, there's about 50 to 60 students per year, so the chances are actually a lot higher than many other 
scholarships based on ATAR and uh, review. And if anybody identifies, self-identifies as an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, we've got one scholarship reserved for them. What do you need? You need to um, uh, have mathematical studies, specialist maths and physics. But if you don't have the specialist maths, you can get in with math studies, physics and chemistry, but you're going to have to take an extra year in your, um, uh, sorry, an extra subject in your first year, and you won't get the ATAR bonus points associated with specialist maths. So my view would be to keep um, your specialist maths going as long as possible. So uh, with that, I would like to conclude. <laughs>